The race for leadership of the Progressive Liberal Party off to a premature start. 140 workers set to be made redundant at the Bahamas Telecommunications Company. And human rights challenges return to the fore in a report by the U.S. State Department. We've got all these stories and more. I'm your host, Ava Turnquist, and this is the Tribune's Top 5. Government leaders this week continue to boast crime reduction efforts, even as the murder rate for 2015 has already outpaced last year's figures. In the Senate this week, State Minister for National Security Keith Bell and Attorney General Allison Maynard Gibson both championed the Christie administration's efforts to fight crime. Mr. Bell suggested that homicides should not be the sole indicator of how bad the crime situation is. His comments come three years after the Progressive Liberal Party erected billboards island-wide highlighting the rise of murders under the former Ingram administration. Both Mr. Bell and Mrs. Maynard Gibson stressed that other serious crimes are trending downward across major categories. However, according to the Tribune's records, the murder count this year is 16% higher compared to the same period last year. Police have recorded 73 homicides compared to the 63 at the same time in 2014. For the fourth consecutive year, police abuse and an inefficient judicial system were highlighted as the most serious human rights problems in the Bahamas by the U.S. State Department. In its annual human rights report, American authorities once again underscored the failure of prison and detention facilities to meet international standards and maintained concerns over corruption, violence and discrimination against women, sexual abuse of children, and discrimination based on ethnic descent, sexual orientation, and HIV status. The 2014 report was released on Thursday and repeatedly indicated that the government did not provide updated data for that year. In response to the report, Foreign Affairs Minister Fred Mitchell cautioned that more should not be made out of the report than what it is. He underscored that the country had nothing to hide and explained that the Bahamas is an open and transparent country and that any entity, including foreign governments, were free to make whatever observations they wished about its systems and practices. He pointed out that there was no official policy of discrimination, nor one that sanctioned abuse against any individual. The first round of downsizing at the Bahamas Telecommunications Company is expected to begin next week, with 140 jobs slated to be made redundant. Bahamas Communications and Public Officers Union Secretary General Dino Roll confirmed that BTC advised both unions representing line staff and upper management that come June 30th, the company intends to make a number of departments redundant. Mr. Roll said the news angered union members and that strike action was very possible. Mr. Roll said BTC executives were cold and callous and did not seem to care that persons' lives were being affected. He called it a slap in the face that union officials had a meeting with management earlier in the week but were not informed of the layoffs at that time. The Tribune understands that some of the areas to be affected include some retail stores, billing departments and directory publications among others. BTC has advised the union that employees impacted by the planned layoffs come from areas that have been identified for outsourcing. The telecommunications company further advised government that it anticipates union and employee backlash from the redundancies and that it will increase security at its locations as a result. The latest development in the Bahamar dispute is a reported deal between the government and the mega resort to pay the $21 million owed for its share of the rerouted West Bay Street costs. According to a source who spoke to the Tribune on the condition of anonymity, the sum will cover the government's portion of the costs for work associated with the development to assist Bahamar in its stalled operations and to help pay the thousands of Bahamians currently on the resort's payroll. Half of the $21 million is expected to be paid on July 1st and the remainder in mid-July. However, it was stated that the money will only be paid if Bahamar can reach an agreement with China Export-Import Bank. The government and Bahama have been unable to agree on how much money was still owed to Bahama for the roadwork since 2013. Under an agreement with the previous Ingram administration, the government agreed it would pay $48.1 million to Bahama if the cost to reconfigure West Bay Street exceeded $70 million. If the figure is less than $70 million, the government would have only been obligated to pay 50% of that fee. Bahama officials claim the road rerouting cost $118 million, but the government has argued that this work was only valued at $58 million. The Christie administration has already paid Bahama $28 million over the past two years for its share of those costs. In February, Deputy Prime Minister Philip Brave Davis criticized Bahama for not being cooperative in the continuing dispute. This week, 
Mr. Davis confirmed that that dispute over how much the government still owes Bahamar for that reconfiguration of West Bay Street was out of his hands and had been transferred to the office of the Prime Minister. Meanwhile, Bahamar is nearly six months behind its December 2014 opening date and has missed a March 27th soft opening. A new opening date has yet to be announced. Speculation was high this week over whether Progressive Liberal Party leader Prime Minister Perry Christie would step down from the post at the party's upcoming convention and just who would take his place. Debate over a possible successor garnered headlines when Minister of Tourism Obi Wilchcom announced his aspirations to lead the party, saying that if he had the chance to become Prime Minister, he would take it. Mr. Wilchcom said an ideal leader must have the trust of the Bahamian people and a commitment to service. Minister of Works Philip Brave Davis also admitted that he would like a chance to lead the PLP if a vacancy became available. While both men have admitted that Mr. Christie has not revealed whether or not he plans to run again, they said they would not contest the leadership post if Prime Minister Perry Christie sought a re-election bid. While in opposition, Mr. Christie indicated that he would consider stepping down as party leader mid-term and name a successor. However, he later said he intended to serve a full term if elected as Prime Minister in 2012. In January this year, Mr. Christie said it would take a compelling, tangible reason for him to lead the PLP into the next general election, revealing that he told his family during the lead-up to the last general election that the 2012 campaign would be his last. The PLP's convention will be held in the last week of October, and all party positions will be up to be contested at that time. Want to get in on the discussion? Well, here's how you can. Like us on Facebook, Tribune News Network. Send us a tweet at Tribune242. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Tribune242, or log on to our website, Tribune242.com.